afternoon. Welcome to Senate Education. It's Tuesday, May 2nd, 149. Mr. O'Grady, thanks for joining us. We are trying to um, encourage our federal delegation. We sent them a letter a while back on school construction funds. Now we're trying to get them to encourage the EPA to look at this, the setting, the standard for uh, PCBs. And we know that the EPA, historically we've heard, has not been great at, or I'd say the federal government in general has not been great at dealing with chemicals of high concern. I can just speak to my own experience with PFAS and certainly your experience with PFAS and other chemicals. What we're asking our delegation to do is to encourage them to look at that, push the EPA to look at that standard. And I would say uh, it's really what we're trying to get them to talk about is the airborne standard. And um, I don't know if anybody wants to add anything to that, but yeah, because there is no, they don't have an air quality standard, do they, from my understanding? I don't think so. They don't have a mandate. So what, what they have is um, for schools. Yep. And so they have, they're called um, EELs, but effectively uh, exposure levels for evaluation. Yep. And they're recommendations. And they have this little flow chart that, that schools are supposed to do. You know, if you were built before 1979, your building may contain building materials. And then it gets to this big gray box for years where it said, you might want to do indoor air testing. This is the federal. Yeah. Okay. And so it's a recommendation. Yeah. It's not a requirement. And then it goes on and says, if you hit one of the, the ELEs, the ELEs, then you evaluate what you're going to do and maybe you put in some mitigation measures maybe you do some more testing and then if you're over 50 parts per million then you have to take the stuff out of the building but the 50 parts per million is really focused on the building material the demolition waste or, waste or construction waste and so that's that's significantly higher, right. first of all, because it's in, it's in a parts per million versus nanograms, the nanograms per, cubic grams per yeah. milliliter. Right? Oh, cubic, cubic. So, yes, I mean, you, you're, you're, there's a significant gap between this mandatory action and their ELE. Um, Have you seen these kinds of gaps before? Well, I, I, I mean, was P, remind me PFAS what they started. Yes, you know? I mean PFAS started at a very very high level, but the the new PFAS standard, which has not been fully formalized and rule yet, will be below Vermont's current standard um, because of the concern and the prevalence of those chemicals that they're effectively everywhere. Um, How did they get to that? Point? I mean, can you just give us some, so when we started the PFAS conversation, the feds had, you know, really high, not high standards, low standards in terms of right. PFAS, and now they're below, or they're so much more stringent than Vermont. Not so much more, but well, more the, stringent. They will be more stringent, right? The, the history of chemical regulation is, it's, it's long and it's a little ugly. Um, it, the, the main, the major law governing is called TOSCA, the Toxic Substance Control Act. And it's, it's not based on a precautionary system, it's based on a, you effectively get approved if you meet certain minor hurdles and then there's a, a an approval for use and then there was basically if something happened then it would be reviewed and 
so a lot of chemicals got out for use without a lot of significant significant review. And the review was usually based on the evaluations and studies made by the manufacturer. They weren't necessarily independent. TOSCA was amended about four years ago now to build in a more precautionary component and to have mandates for EPA to review the health and safety of a certain number of chemicals per year. It's going okay, mm -hmm. um, but there are thousands of chemicals and it's a, the chemical is allowed for its use until EPA brings it in for review um, and, and makes a determination on its safety efficacy. What's problematic to an extent about that EPA review, it sounds great, at least they're reviewing, at least they have a mandate to review a certain number each year. But once a chemical is in review, the states are preempted from regulating. And so states are otherwise can adopt um, their own regulations of these chemicals, but once it's in that EPA review, it's basically that preempt, that regulation is kind of forestalled. Um, so it, it makes it somewhat, I wouldn't say it's a risky act to, to try to regulate a chemical, it's just that you, you're potentially your state regulation will not, will not be valid for, for a period of time while it's under EPA review. What, like, what's the period of time usually? Oh, I'd have to go back and look at my summary, the, it's called the Frank Lautenberg Act, I have to go back and look at that. But, but like a couple of years or like a couple of decades or <laughs> somewhere in between. Question. I, I think I, I, I don't I have to go back. I haven't looked at that. I have a, I have a fact sheet on it that I did that I can give you all. Um, but it that that federal law interplays with other states that are regulating. California has what it's called what it was originally called the Green Chemistry Rules, where they've identified chemicals that they believe are um, dangerous or toxic. And uh, once they've identified it as dangerous or toxic, the manufacturer of a product with it has to, has to label it as California has found that this has been trained. I mean, open up a string of Christmas lights and there's yep. like a little, label on it that says the California sound of coding to be potentially harmful. I just bought this. Was a In the West? Yeah. yeah. So uh, the states are making efforts that are that are more precautionary, I would say, than EPA. But EPA is also making improvements to TOSCA, not necessarily it's not say like the EU standard where EU, you basically have to prove that it's safe and it goes through years of review and then there's something called the Ross standards where you don't get to be used if you're found to not be in compliance. And it's a more precautionary approach, but it takes time and it takes money to navigate. So I'm just, I know you can't predict this, but I guess if we were to have the administration in right now and say, hey, should we move in this direction? They might say there's some risk because if it does come under review, it could be a long time before the state can then well, deal so, with it. So right now you say the current testing program and the action levels that have been set up for that, they're not that significantly different from from EPA, I mean, they, they are lower, but I think Commissioner Levine, yeah, he, he did a side-by-side -side yeah. of what they are. And, you know, the screening level, EPA screening level is actually lower than Vermont, it's more protective, but the action level in Vermont is, is much more protective, um, and then the immediate action level is also much more protective. And, Vermont's 
action level depends on the age of the exposed population, the duration of exposure, et cetera. And, and EPA has some of that too. They have, theirs is kind of based on age, not necessarily duration of exposure, but. Um, so I guess my question is, you know, is A, that you would want EPA to revise its standards for PCB exposure, is it just in schools or is it in all indoor air quality? I'm inclined to say all indoor air quality and have natural resource and energy look at it also in health okay. and welfare. Because there are other entities that regulate PCB, PCB exposure levels, um, like OSHA. Okay. Uh, so in the workplace, the occupation of OSHA has um, a time weighted average, an airborne concentration of one milligram per cubic meter for PCBs containing 42% chlorine, and then the, the exposure level for PCBs with 54% chlorine in an average molecular formula um, is a different standard, but they don't actually spell it out here. But And then NIOSH also has standards. NIOSH is the National Institute on Occupational Safety and Health. Um, and they have a they have a separate standard for workplace. So so there are other standards that are adopted by other entities. Um, you know, NIOSH's standard is a narrative standard. They recommend that any exposure be reduced to the lowest possible exposure level. What does that stand for again? NIOSH. National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. And they're all lower than the EPA. They're more stringent than the EPA. Well, the OSHA standard with the one can be. Yeah. Um, so I, I think really what you're asking for is to have a mandatory exposure levels in schools, indoor air quality in schools, that is more protective school populations than their current recommended levels. And then the question is, do you think that they should mandate testing schools? At the federal level? Yes. Mandate and pay. Mm -hmm. That's Not key. Left. I like the idea of the pay, <laughs> for sure. Do you mind uh, drafting something to the effect of what you just said, more stringent, with financing, again, we could re-emphasize, we could look at our school construction letter and perhaps you know, re-emphasize the need for funds sure. going forward with just general school construction. But yeah, and okay. then we can take a look at it okay. the next couple of days and I can run it by the chairs of health and welfare and uh, natural resources and energy. Oh, I got a question. Yeah, please. So in uh, S25, PFAS? Yeah, yeah. We set a tougher standard than even in California. When, uh, so does that mean that the federal government isn't testing, hasn't, hasn't set a standard for PFAS? So the federal government came out um, almost 18 months ago now with uh, what they're calling the PFAS roadmap. And so they identified their, their major media um, areas that they regulate in air, water, waste, toxic substances, and they are um, proposing standards for PFAS standards for each of those four major categories. So they recently proposed taking some PFAS off of the approved list under TSCA, mm -hmm. um, and they are proposing water quality standards, drinking water standards. Um, solid waste management standards, but the those standards won't become enforceable until they're enacted as rule, and so um, that's their next step. And they have a they have what they call the roadmap. They have a roadmap to getting there, but it also depends on who's in the administration at the time when it rulemaking is right uh, because 
from prior transitions, some rules just are are just put put aside and don't go forward. But I think that rule, or at least some of those rules, because of the pressure from states and the prevalence of PFAS contam contamination, it's, it's coast to coast. It's everywhere that you can think of it. Um, water, soil, waste. Um, that there will likely be state pressure for them to continue with these components of those rules. And Vermont had its own PFAS bill a few years ago that directed a &R to come up with the drinking water standard, which they have, come up with the hazardous waste standard, which they have, and to come up with a water quality standard, which they had not done yet because they wanted it to be consistent, if not with EPA, but regionally with with New England states, and that's going to be a tougher one to do because that is about how you because you don't really know all of the sources of PFAS. Just take Bennington, for example. Mm -hmm. There's probably PFAS leaching from soil into groundwater, and groundwater reaches surface water, and then that's in your surface water. And how do you account for that? water quality standard. It's just there leaching into groundwater, which is leaching into surface water. And how do you manage that? I, I don't know. Is there a chemical that's as ubiquitous as PFAS that you can think of? I mean, it's, it is everywhere, right? I mean. There, there are many chemicals that are as ubiquitous as PFAS. Um, I will say that manufacturers are, are becoming more aware of what they're using and not just trying to reach an end result, but being um, precautionary, using some systems that have been enacted, ISO systems, uh, blue sign, things like that, that are management techniques for what you're going to put in your product how it's going to be ultimately uh, handled. But, but there's, there are, there's tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of chemicals that are approved for use. And um, some of them, the full effect is not known. Right. <laughs> that's a sad, that's a sad note. To end on, but to Nader's point, when you talked about school construction, mm -hmm. like we got to make sure we're building, if we're building new schools or renovating that we're not using chemicals that we don't understand yet. Yeah. Well, that, that I think is one of the industries that it was was first impacted by chemical management is is the construction industry because PCBs were in they were in. A, Ton of things, lamps, caulk, paint, um, and they had to pivot away from those, and they and they had to move towards materials that were that were better. But you know, you pivot from one thing into another. Um, there are entities that certify some building materials as being safer than others. <laughs> But I don't know if they can fully guarantee that they are safe. Yeah. All right, I will start a letter. Thanks, Mike. Um, do you want it to be addressed to the federal delegation Del specifically, then CC, say, Commissioner Levine, Secretary Moore, um, the Bruce, governor? Phil Bruce, Speaker. Yeah. 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 All right. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, um, Do you know who the contact at EPA would be? Have you talked to anyone at EPA on this? The only person I've talked to or had any correspondence 
Judith Bank, who used to be this district. Yes. Okay. I will, but I can reach out to Judith and find out. Uh, all my EPA contacts are dead or retiring, so. All right. <laughs> I will have to figure that out. Thanks. All right, I need to run up. We'll pick up at 2.30. Okay, everyone, welcome back to Senate Education, Tuesday, May 2nd. From one easy topic to another, 483. Committee discussion. Um, I think I know where most, I think I know where everybody is, actually. But want to open it up for conversation and discussion. As you know, uh, We've got the 2200 rule, the anti-discrimination piece in, seems to be working effectively. We have the piece having to do with special education in, starting uh, July 1. We have the moratorium on schools, which I know uh, people have been asking me a little bit about. And uh, that would mean any and all schools uh, until further notice and basically I think what we would do next year is is assess um, you know uh, to see how many and we could talk to the state board about this how many how many districts are in the queue or how many schools are in the queue why would they want to start uh, a new school um, uh, some people have mentioned you know, the possibility of special education schools starting, but the only way to do this, given court cases, etc., is one blanket moratorium for the time being on new schools starting. So I think everybody knows where I am on this bill, uh, but this is an opportunity for committee discussion and to Senator Sheen, do you want to start the conversation? Sure. Uh, well, I think, I mean, my, so first, I think the moratorium is the most important piece. Uh, it sounds like that's also moving in a different bill, appropriations, right? Yeah. Uh, so the moratorium is important. Ending the international schools situation uh, is important. The anti-discrimination piece, I like that. The the tuition piece uh, regarding regarding the subsidizing of um, private students using public dollars um, and how you have to divide that. I think that hmm. is is one of my concerns. I'm not sure. <laughs> I feel like there's a lot more understanding that needs to happen there as to the impact that that will have. Yeah. Um, can you explain that some more? Yeah. yeah. Can we look at it in the bill and then yeah, maybe sure. speak this, to yeah, it? Sure. This is my one without any notes. Anymore. I know. I can't Actually, find mine. I might have, have one notes. I have one with notes too, and I. I think the way it was written was pretty much as Senator Hashim ah, just outlined, which is public dollars cannot be used to offset, I think, costs oh, and needs yes. of a private pay student. Oh, okay. I think that is what yeah, that, that it can't be subsidized. Um, and you have a problem with that, or you don't? I just don't quite know how you do it. Fleshed out enough, um, and how what what the impact would be on different schools, and how they'd have to change things, um, both for current students and existing students, and you know what towns will have to do to backpedal to reassess what they're paying for tuition because the schools will be changing what they pay or what they're requiring the towns to pay for tuition as far as I understand it. I mean we could ask the president pro tem 
for funding to look into that this summer and pull together uh, a group of legislators and others. Um, I, I think it would require, uh, yeah. and we would have to take some testimony. I, I don't know if it would, I'm guessing it would require two sets of books for the school, but maybe the school kind of does that. I, I don't know. Um, not sure what, um, what it does in the end, but that's. Uh... I mean, I know that I had an email from a constituent, and I don't know if this is what you're talking about, saying that <clears throat> the tuition kids going to that school are paying more than the non tuitioned kids. Does that make sense? Is that what we're talking about? So, are you saying that tuition, the kids that are coming from a tuitioning town, are paying more than yeah, the, the others? Right. I mean, can we make it so that it's that it's equal? Um, well, that's a local. I mean, school board set the tuition oh. rate. Uh, I mean, we can. I always say we can do whatever we want. We're the legislature, but. I mean, it would clearly have to take some testimony on it um, and look into it, or we could even look into it over the summer um, to try to understand. And Senator Hashim, I'm trying to understand. So you're thinking it might interrupt schools right now if it passes like that? Um. Some, yeah, some, yeah, that's, that's yeah, one piece yeah. of it, but I'm, I'm actually just trying to find it. Yeah. You know. I mean, I think one of the things we heard was that uh, And again, we, we haven't, people want to see the numbers or take more testimony uh, on this at some point. We know that independent schools don't get construction aid, and so they do get, so a lot of that's private funding, and private funding, we did hear from one witness, offsets the tuition costs of some of the funding for other kids. But, um, What I'm trying to get us, get us to is, uh, well, keep going on that topic if you want. Yeah, no, I, uh, I can't quite find it, so. I mean, I know it's, it's, it's yeah. in the bill. And, I mean, the, but on another topic, the attestation, that is, is that immediate and then yearly? And I'd like to make sure that's an attestation that they're not discriminating in their enrollment process, have it be immediate, and then you know, they have to do it now and then also on a yearly basis. I'm not that, sure if it's yearly or not. No, but that's a good but idea. I would think yeah. I would think that we should. And I would think it would probably do all schools, frankly, in the state. Yeah. 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 No, I think I think you're right. Here's my topic. Um, I'm going to go through my drawer one more time. Okay. See if my very marked up ones. So I guess the question, another way to think about it is, what are people's goals? If you look at the Macon decision, my response to that, again, similar to what we did to last year in 219, the anti-discrimination policy, uh, the moratorium, which is new, and then we've got the uh, special education language. I don't know what else we could do to Macon. Yeah, I don't know either. No. Um, other than, well, I mean, then, then the other then option is severe, 66. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or 283. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, that's how this conversation first got started, was making. Right. Is it my turn to speak? Yeah, whenever. We're just having <laughs> a conversation. Okay. I thought it was um, Unless Senator Hashim, Hashim and that. then... <clears throat> no, we're just chatting. Okay. We're not going to... Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, I think you all know that I, uh, I would like to vote on this. I think I don't. I'm I'm new here in the state house, as, as everyone knows. But I get the sense that this is something that comes up every so often. Is sort of like this accountability piece with independent schools. Um, so it seems to be a sticking point in across the landscape, the legislative landscape. Um, and to me, this bill is fairly. I mean, relatively innocuous. I think if you look at the title of it, it's an act relating to the, the accountability and oversight of approved independent schools that are eligible to receive public tuition. And I just don't see where this is going to be that much of a hardship for our independents. I don't think it, it's going to cause any of them to close. I don't think it's catastrophic and, and I think at the same time it does achieve some accountability and oversight that for me because you guys know I use the word equity a lot but it seems to like add to sort of a more equitable landscape in terms of like what our statewide education system looks like so um, I would love to vote on it um, I, I really applaud the folks who work on this. I think it was like a, a nice balance between accountability and oversight, but not being too um, stringent um, or limiting to independent schools. So, I mean, I wish someone could be a little bit more clear on what they don't like about this or what they think is really horrible about this because that no one's really been able to express that so so i mean i can say just from where i'm sitting mm -hmm. uh and i'd be interesting to talk to the prior chair i feel like in a way there has been this interest kind of from some folks to deal with this kind of stuff but i don't know still what the problem is the problem for me is making like we said last week, I would much rather be talking about all the things that are happening right now with kids, honestly, than this. And so let's take the interview process, for example. We heard that there's an interview process for CTE programs. And we also heard that not all public schools take kids. They can expel kids. You get expelled, you can't go to the next school. I mean, there are all sorts of things out there. So it's not quite black and white for me on, on let's say the interview process <clears throat> um, I also was compelled by the woman whose kid you know, there are situations and I've talked about this a lot happy to keep talking about it though honestly it's just not a fit for this for the kid that's why some of these that's why we have so many special education schools or therapeutic schools in the state and I do worry about and I know you do too teen suicide and LGBTQ kids What's the right spot for the kid? We heard about the family that had to move. <clears throat> so I'm trying, so that interview process, if you're gonna go to the campus, you're gonna get a sense or a feel of what that's like. I don't see that as a, an accountability kind of thing. Accountability to me is, uh, I mean, if kids are leaving, if we, if we had, under parents saying their kids weren't being educated or experiencing those things. What I think this is, honestly, is kind of a, again, for me, Macon is the most important thing. And I think that has been accomplished. When I think of my goals, that's, I believe, we have done a solid job and then we would reassess next year to see whether or not, based on, 2200 rule, special ed, and the moratorium where things are at. But I came to this with, and we did last year, making. Right. So I, I again, I'll just weigh in. Yes. I, I think there will always, always be individual cases of a kid who's not happy somewhere. That's totally. just, that will yeah. all, you know, that'll always be the case. Yeah. I'm looking at it as a system 
that we need to invest in, that we need to support, and that we need to hold accountable. So if there are kids who are failing in a system, then the AOE and whoever else, whatever, whatever other governing body we have needs to step in and yeah. fix the problem. Will it be fixed for everybody? Probably not. But I'm looking for what is the best system that will benefit the most kids. Um, and I'm particularly interested in, obviously, the, our most vulnerable. And by that I mean, you're right, LGBT kid, Q kids, uh, kids from the global majority, kids living in poverty. Um, we have to build a super strong system to, as you, you've heard me say, right, lift them out of poverty. It's always, education was always the great equalizer, and that's kind of what we need to be focused on as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I agree with you. I want to work on other stuff. Yeah. That's why, to, and I was hoping you he might want to testify, but um, I was, you know, we're going to be, it sounds like if we don't vote on this and if we can't move it, that we will be again next year dealing with this. Well, it depends on really what the goals, everybody's goal really is. Again, for me, just speaking for myself, my goal coming was Macon. And how do we deal with Macon? I would much rather deal with it, pieces that we have, move forward, and work and, and might we tweak something might we find something over the summer that we would need to tweak in terms of accountability i don't know how interviews get to accountability i just don't i mean not requiring interviews not you know that kind of thing doesn't i you know senator hashim's question about the funding okay we could maybe pull that kind of thing apart but i'm not sure how we What's going to make, I mean, again, as much, it depends on people's goals and objectives. As much as an interview can be used by a student to choose a school, it seems like it could be used by a school to choose a student. And we, I have said, you've heard testimony, public schools take basically everybody, right? I'm sure you can make exceptions, but it's basically they take right. everybody. And if we've got public dollars going to these quote unquote independent schools, they should have to do the same. That is an equitable landscape. But then do we shut off the CTE program that they turned away 40% no, of the kids No, see, and CTE year. is under a different governing model. It's under a different governing structure. But it's but still if public you, money. But if you want it's to shut the money. CTE schools down, then yes. No, I mean, of course I don't. I don't want to shut any of them down. And I think what we learned was exactly that the CTE, they benefit from that. And, you know, they really do. They are like, hey, somebody had a disciplinary issue going to take them or somebody had this and so they turn people away can't say that it's right for them and it's not okay for others in my opinion well if that's the line that we have to draw then, then you know if that's what you're suggesting i'm then... not i'm thinking we allow people to continue and let the cte program continue as it's doing it well that's I, but again, again that's, I just this ask, is a committee I would discussion for a vote. talk I would about ask it. for a vote Did so on page seven, uh, yeah. So page seven is where a few different points uh, that I brought up are located. Um, the idea of having student publicly tuition student rates be the same or lower than the tuition rate for private payer students, uh, and having the tuition rates be published on the school's website. That's at the top of the page. Um, and also, I'm using the as passed by the House version. Is that? Yes, that's what I've got. Um, yes, I bet that is. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to find. Page oh, here seven we of 24. So wait, what is your issue with that, not, uh, Senator Hashim? I don't have an issue with it. I think it makes sense. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, page seven. Then the attestation is on section 10, or starts on line seven through 11. Uh, school attests on or before August 1 of each year uh, in compliance with the requirements of Subdivision 9, which and I think Subdivision 9 is the anti-discrimination piece. So I'm sorry, do you mind just going back to page 7, just yep. so I, I'm following? So yep. tell me a little bit, this is uh, page 7, subsection 10. 10. Okay, Start school test. Ah. Um, start at the top, is it? Uh, no, uh, section 10, the school attests on or before August of the year to compliance with the requirements, all other statutory requirements. Yeah, 
And subdivision nine is the anti-discrimination piece, right? Um, I'm assuming, but I don't. I'm, I'm not sure. And again, we're just having committee discussion. I'm trying to get a sense of where people generally are. And then the, and then the. the so the attestation is required, though, remember, by 2200 rules. Okay. Yeah. So we're just repeating. That yeah. Look. So that is required by 2200 rules um, on non discrimination. And there's an enforcement process. Yeah. I believe I mean, in the is the enforcement process, is it, is it happening? We could find out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's in the 2200, so uh, we can ask Beth. Because I, I thought there were some schools that didn't attest, or they refused to. Well, the or 2200 like, rule is pretty, I mean, it's just been in effect. Uh, I'll have to check with Beth. We did lose, remember, a bunch of schools decided not to go forward because they weren't comfortable with the anti-discrimination policy. So those schools won't get public funding. Yeah, so that's what, in that, my opinion, it's working. Yeah, I feel yeah. like that accomplishes right. our underlying right. goal of right. not putting public right. funds towards schools that discriminate, that discriminate. regardless yeah. of what, yeah. of how they're affiliated. Yeah. Um, the piece that I did have some um, confusion slash concerns about was at the bottom of page seven, which is, that's where the, the division of tuition um, is described. And right. That's the one I'm, I'm not quite sure is I guess, ready for prime time. I, I don't know if it. Right. Yeah. We could figure out a way to sort of jump into that. But back to the attestation, it is. So a bunch of schools decided not to sign it. And that's why they're sort of not going to be approved by the state board. We can always have Jen Samuelson in to confirm that. And the, on the back, uh, page eight, um, is there any idea why we don't want to have a private right of action if what I believe is the anti-discrimination piece is, uh, is not complied with? No private right of action is created by this subdivision against an improvement. I also need to confirm that subdivision 9 is actually the anti-discrimination. State board is authorized to use its powers. Um, we can ask Beth. Yeah, I vaguely remember. I don't have my good side by side, so... Uh, I was just expecting just to get a sense of where everybody was. What page are you on? Uh, page eight at the top. So I believe, yeah, so it looks like section nine, or subdivision nine, is the piece that covers um, the admissions process, uh, the policies to comply with the Public Accommodations Act, and fair employment practices. tuition rate, the application fees. And the non yeah, and non-discrimination is located in at the very end in mm -hmm. subsection I. So is there a problem with that? I mean have we got any independent schools that are are not doing those things? It seems like it. Well, it seems like it, but you know, I think this is a solution looking for a problem. Yeah, I don't. I, don't I really don't. I don't. Is it functioning right now? I think that. I mean, I really think we need to be there. Not go. Well, we're just having committee right discussion now? today. Yeah. David's not here. Yeah. I want to be respectful to right. the Senator Weeks too. But I wanted to get a sense of where people are on this. Um, and if I were to summarize, correct me if I'm wrong. I think there are. There's one person that would want and ready to vote on the full enchilada. Correct. Okay. One who might have some concerns about sections, certain sections. Yeah. Uh, and then the two of us who 
are happy with, at least at this point, with what we have done already and want to see that wait and see what happens next year uh, to see how the 2200 Act 173 and the um, moratorium take effect. So the moratorium that is being included elsewhere, yeah. that includes international schools? No, it, that includes just that's no new schools right. can start okay. whatsoever. Can we somehow incorporate no international schools on public dollars? Yeah. On that moratorium? I, mm, on the moratorium? No, that's not, that's a different, that's not a moratorium. That's not sending public dollars out of this. Yeah. Out of this I, know what you're, I know what you're trying to, yeah. to get. I know it's not a moratorium per se. Right, right. Yeah. In the umbrella of education yeah. generally. Yeah. Is it? If I were to summarize, correct me if I'm wrong, you're thinking it's on the international students. Yeah. I do think we need a little, we need more information. If we were down the road to say no more dollars out of state, the 25 mile thing, I think needs some real looking at. I mean, I'd still like to know how they got there. Um, you know, what if the ideal school is 30 miles or, or whatever? Um, uh, but yeah, let me let me talk with uh, probes on the international piece. I mean, are you okay with that? Well, are, are Vermont tax dollars going to Switzerland or no? What, yeah, about, I, what I, about a prep school in Massachusetts? Well, I think we need to look at the whole state and look and pull the schools out. If if there's a school that's in Quebec, you know, rather than it's 25 miles away, rather than busing kids 50 miles, you know, like somebody we had a test testimony that said if you pulled all the independent schools out, there'd be some awful gaps. Well, sure, especially in rural Vermont and right. special education I, areas. I, I, think. I think there could be, I mean, I want Beth for this, but I, I think there could be legal issues for a, for a state government picking and choosing international policies. Interesting. So I, I think it's something that, that it, you know, I, I think it would have to be all or nothing internationally. Yeah. Um, but, well, yeah. so are you okay with a family that moves to Land Grove and has four kids, and all four kids go to Deerfield Academy in New Hampshire, and all of our Vermont tax dollars go to Deerfield? Are you okay with that? I don't know where Deerfield is. I mean, it's, a, it's a fancy yeah, what's private the school. What's, what's the distance? I mean, if there's a closer 40, school. 40, 50 miles, maybe? Not really. Hmm? I'm not really. Okay. Are you? No. I, I, mean, I think the, I, I, I don't think it, the therapeutic schools, I understand that. There mm -hmm. are, you know, there, there are circumstances where it makes yeah. sense that, you know, there's a very specialized school for somebody with needs that can't be met even anywhere in New England. I think that Completely. should be an exception. Go wherever you need to go. Um, yeah, I agree. But, you know, sending, you know, going to Land Grove, if that was the time you said, and then using that to send your kids to a super fancy prep school that's beyond our borders, well beyond our borders. I, I don't think uh, I don't really think that makes sense. So maybe we do fifty miles. I just don't. My thing is the twenty-five miles. I don't know. It seems to me like I'd rather dig into that a little bit more and just try to understand. I think digging into all. it can make sense, but. Yeah, I don't know. It's yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know what I'd like to sort of get a sense also of. I mean, are there four kids going to Deerfield right now? Are there? You know, I just like I to mean, get a I, sense. I mean, I use the family that I know as an example, so oh. that's why I that's why I chose that example. I mean, Senator Weeks did bring up a point. I think he mentioned a school that was twenty eight miles out. Right. He knows people are going to, and yeah, yeah. It, but then you know where where you. You have to draw a line that's some mileage, you know, Completely. Like this way. so. Yeah. Except, and I agree with you, if it's if it's a if it's a special needs school. Yeah. 
and I remember we kept this in 219, we said, wherever you need to go so that your child gets the best education they possibly can. And I think, and I don't know if there are many kids outside of New England, but I think there was a kid in the Midwest at one point for um, severe disability. So that helps me to understand where people are. Okay, anything else? What were you describing regarding the interview process? Really, what, is there something you want to change there? Well, so the interview process thing for me. Is that located? Yeah, so. <laughs> I like that kids. I mean, getting rid of, I guess somebody would have to make the case for me why a kid shouldn't just have experience, an interview, campus tour, get a feel for the place, um, see if it's a good fit, that kind of thing. I don't know where it I is. Think the, that was my. <clears throat> that might be in subdivision nine. Let's see. where it says the school shall not use an admissions process right. publicly tuition students and includes mandatory interviews and academic entrance, entrance exams, academic history, mandatory exams for consideration of ability to pay. Or like a prep school. Page 15. Yeah. What page? Um, I don't know. I'm looking at my side by side. All right. but. Yeah, I mean, I the CTE I thought was a great example. I mean, she doesn't take everybody. She said she turns like 30 or 40 kids away. I don't think, if we're going to really treat everybody the same, I think let people have that experience. Well, those are different circumstances. But also, I have they to are. wonder. using a band song. I mean. Right. You got a oh, well, sure. discipline but issue. Or you're welding people, with, you know, I mean. Not using reasonable judgment to do things in CTE, that's smart. Right, and I don't think you should be allowed. Absolutely. I think she should continue to yeah, be allowed in her view. Um, uh, the other thing, yeah. I have a note here that says that, and it's next to, uh, it, it's in that subdivision nine, but it says that public schools rely on a transcript to determine placement. And that's just my scribblings. But I mean, if that's the case, then is that something that we should also have for private schools? Because if public schools are relying on a trend, I want to confirm it because maybe I misunderstood something. But uh, well, that's to determine placement. They, they'll still take the kid regardless of what's right. on their transcript. So. I mean, honestly, when I hear this conversation, I'll be honest, and I know we're not on the same page on this. Transcripts, placement, interviews, I'd be rather be talking about bigger things. I mean, I'm not sure in terms of accountability. Accountability is no discrimination. Make sure you're, you're giving the academics that the state and federal government require in terms of special education. That's just me. I mean, people can make the, keep making the case for this. I just, I, I don't see it. I mean, I just, if somebody said, oh, you've got to make sure all the schools are doing X, Y, and Z, and it made sense because we had 30 parents in here that said, my kid's not being educated. I'm not sure how this improves public education or independent education. I just don't see how it improves. Like it really makes a difference in terms of, please go ahead. I, I think the point regarding the interviews is, you know, it, is the fact that a school, an independent school can say, yeah, we're not, you know, we attest that we're not going to be discriminatory, but you are gonna have to go through this interview and in the back of the admissions officer's mind, they can say, yeah, we're not going to let this kid in for whatever reasons. But of course, on the record, they can say, you know, yeah, we, we just don't think you're a good fit for, you know, maybe, I don't know, it, the, the more nefarious reasons. <laughs> right. And I feel like the nefarious reasons are what we're trying to get at. Right. Right.
So I, I think we're still at the same spot. Full steam ahead. Some questions. Two people who are saying, okay, right now we have those three things in place. Let's assess next year. I don't see how this bill is harmful to our independent schools. Is there, can someone point that out? Can someone show me the harm that this will do to independent schools? We generally try to do things that improve the lives of schools and kids. Right. We don't try to do things, think about them in a harmful way. How does it advance the world? So one way it advances the world uh -huh. is by trying to create a more equitable landscape and building capacity in our public schools. How? So, well, if we are allowing some schools to discriminate based on whatever and others not to, We're that's not. number one. Yeah. Number two, if we have some schools that have endowments of $400 million mm -hmm. and land holdings in you know $300 million and pay their superintendent $450,000 a year, while a public superintendent is making 150, that's information that we should all be privy to. So that accountability piece, which is not even in here, it's not but in that, at all. I understand right. that. But that is the kind of thing that ultimately would level the playing field a little bit more. So building capacity in our in our public schools is what this is about, because our public schools serve the most amount of kids in the state, mm -hmm. and all kids regardless of their ability, their special education needs, et cetera, et cetera. So, I and mean, that's also remember what Act 173 is about to do in all of our independence. And we do suspect there is going to be, as we've heard a little bit, some independents that are going to close because they're just not going to do the special education piece and they're not going to get the public funds. Um, yeah, and I completely agree. Most of our kids are in public schools, and I would love to be having a conversation, frankly, about our public schools. I do. Absolutely. I would love that. I but, mean, I would but, love that. But, this seems to me like <laughs> kind of interviews and this and that, and okay, but I don't see it building capacity. Yeah, I mean, and you know, there are some exactly. some areas. Remember, there are no public schools. We know that. We know that there are no all spots like that. Don't know where he is. Yes, you're right. The our, the where landscape was going. You're right. We have these independent schools, but again, I, 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 if it's you know, if it's for optics, if it's for creating a more equitable landscape in the state of Vermont, I, I don't see how we cannot be in favor of that. It just doesn't and, and that's why, make sense to me. And for me, at least, that's why the anti-discrimination piece and the special ed piece are so important to me. Those are, and then the moratorium, I mean, and maybe you would disagree. If, if we didn't have those in already moving forward, I would think that that would be the center part of this bill. My opinion. It was this, those were the center parts of it last year. I, I mean, yeah, you, you, you've made your, you've made. No, your, we've all made our. Right. Yeah. Everyone's made their their cases. Um, I would be really disappointed if we, at the very least, cannot have some kind of restriction on where our Vermont taxpayer dollars are going. That seems like a real basic to me. Seems like we, and I don't want to speak for everybody, it seems like there's a general somewhat of a consensus that we don't want to send taxpayer dollars overseas. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, yeah, I think Senator Weeks also had that concern. He, he was, I think what, he, he's not here, I don't want to fully speak for him, but he had a very good point. Let's find out who the kids are, what the situation is, we don't bring things generally to the floor that say, hey, we're going to stop. Like, like, let's understand it. I think that was his only piece. And, and if I, I remember, remember correctly, there was, I think it was a dozen or so kids that are overseas, or maybe it was nine. I can't remember. It was a really small number. I thought but, it was two, but I could be wrong. Oh, okay. Well, I could be wrong. Yeah. Well, um, so, yeah, I, I think, I'm pretty sure there's a grandfathering clause in here, so it's not as if. Some right. kid in Switzerland is suddenly going to be kicked out of a school with nowhere to go. Right. I don't want to send our our state dollars out of the state. So I know you guys have this 
you you don't like the 25 mile rule I, I i don't want to send money out of state period build capacity in our state with our public dollars i didn't say i don't i didn't say i don't like the 25 mile rule i, 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 I think, think what i said i just want to understand I mean, you're willing to draw a line in the sand on the moratorium. You're saying no more new schools. Right. Um, so there's a line drawn there. Why can't we draw a line that says no more state money leaving the state? Yeah, and I think it goes to what Senator Weeks had previously said about the school that's 28 miles out. Well, you know, so, it's, 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 so that's drawing a line in the sand. Right. So where do we want to ultimately draw that line? Do we want to draw it at 30? Or do we want to draw it at five? Or, you know, what, I'm curious, why, why 25 as opposed to 50? I mean, it takes an hour to drive 50 miles. I don't know, it's just questions to ask about why we're picking that number. I think there should be a reason as to why we're landing on a number that will change a number of families' plans for where they're sending their kids to school. Um, I just don't think it should be arbitrary. But again, so. you can grandfather it in. I mean, I I grew up in a district that had kids bust in from an hour away. Mm -hmm. I mean, Alberg, Isle Lamont, North Hero, South Hero, Grand Isle, was, they were always sent to South Burlington, Burlington, Essex, Colchester. I mean, that's just the way it's been. Now, Isle Lamont kids are very, very close to the Canadian border. Right. Um, but. The, a bus was paid for, and and they're you know they took the bus to these schools, and I mean I, it just it can be done. Yeah, I don't disagree that it. Can yeah, be I mean, done. yeah, sure it can be done. Yes, procedurally, if we don't like this bill, we'd have to amend it, right? The Senate back to the house. Yeah, I mean it's you know it's yeah. Anytime you don't like a bill, you generally is it, is amend it, or you could. I, I don't, that's why we're having this sort of committee discussion to see what, what folks are at. Yeah. Uh, anything else? This is helpful. I appreciate it. Um, I know it's hard. I, I know it's. We do have a grandfathering clause in here. Yeah, I believe we do. I believe we do. Yeah, yeah. We can check. Um, because, uh, it, it, I mean, it's hard, and yet, again, I would much rather, and I think everybody would, be talking about COVID, mental health, teacher salaries, all these kinds of things. Um, and, and frankly, I think the people that are leading this charge should be also working on those things, honestly. I think uh, if this is what the public education advocates, this is the biggest, most important bill for them. This, given all the issues we have in this state, yeah, I'm disappointed. I'm frankly really disappointed. Well, I, I think mean, another, that's me. Another, like, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think one of the underlying, very underlying issues is the fact that with every kid that leaves a public school, that's less money that's going to the public school. So there's less resources to do the things like raising teacher salaries or financing programs that are helpful for kids with special needs or uh, you know, doing the things that a public school wants to do. So I think that is the underlying issue that is slowly deteriorating public schools. That, that, that's what I think is at the heart of it. I mean, for me, the heart of this has been, at least again for me, is how do we deal with Macon? I think there are a range of schools out there, some public schools that are doing incredible work, uh, even after COVID. Um, and then we've got some schools that also need our help and our assistance, and that's where I personally would rather focus. But. There's also a number of independent schools that are doing nice things or great things uh, for their communities and for kids that huge aren't game changers. Yeah. Game changers. So, I think of the Compass School, honestly. Yeah. That's a spot where kids need to go. And I would say, you know, you look at 
everybody wants to paint the brush of all these kids that go to independent schools are rich kids. St. Johnsbury, Linden, and even Manchester, there are free and reduced lunch levels. Um, but there's nothing in this bill that would change that. No, no, no. I'm just talking about we're on the topic of what independent schools are offering to the community and things like that. Well, no. Um, no, I just getting back to yeah. the earlier comment. I, I think it's I don't think it's fair to say that advocates haven't been focused on a number of issues around our schools. Um, one thing that they've been advocating for is a pause on the PCB testing, which is another added stress on the system, particularly the private system. But but again, I know that nothing's <laughs> going to happen with that either. But. It's, it's not fair to say that this is the only thing that they've been advocating for, because that's not true. I mean, frankly, I would push back on them and say, the PCB testing, the question is, are you doing something that administrators want, or are you doing something that's good for kids? And I like to keep focused over and over again, and I believe PCB testing is good for kids. I think uh, this landscape of schools that we have are good for kids. I even think the hazing and harassment conversation we had, if we lowered that standard, that's good for kids. Every one of those issues, the public school folks say, no, no, no. I believe they're good for kids. They're saying they're not good for kids. That's disconcerting to me. It really is. It's about, how you know. Is, how is the testing good for kids? Uh, just explain that to me. For me, knowledge is power. And if you're in a school, all of a sudden it gets tested, and that is so high, you know that something has to be done to that classroom. But if you don't have, if your district doesn't have the resources to pay for it, and the state isn't willing to pay for it, then what do you do? We have the funds set aside, as you know, in 486, that's, that actually put money there and are released to use those funds. Those funds, nothing is in those funds. The 16 million that we gave Burlington, there's, I don't know how many, millions of dollars are left, but those are the dollars that are going to be used for some of these schools. That's not going to pay for a complete renovation. That does not mean raising the school, but it does mean making certain that a child or a pregnant teacher or somebody who's going through a developmental you know, phase in their lives knows that it's there and we can deal with it. That's how I think it's really good for kids. And, and procedurally, when you have a, like this, what we just found out, you find that they're PCBs, so you go in and you try to mitigate, and that makes the situation worse. Well, we're going to hear what? from them, as we are, you know, this is, that's a one, you know, we, we, we should listen, we should hear what they have to say. I personally don't see why stopping makes sense, uh, even with that one situation. I think, you know, We've also, back to equity, we have tested, what, 20% of our schools? There are a lot of schools that want to get tested. Those are state funds. Why would we shut them off at this point? I get it. It's a hard thing that's happening out there. No question about it. Um, and we'll hear more from Matt Chapman. On the, hey, yeah. So those are the three things for me um, that I think are kid-centric, in my opinion. Harassing and bullying. This. Uh, and the PCB, and I have been disappointed. I really have been. I would much rather every day come in here and talk about mental health issues in school, all sorts of different things. But we can agree to disagree. Anything else? How many of you are gonna to request to get off of the committee? Well, look at me. I'm here for the long haul. All right, good, good. Okay, I'm going to go to chairs in a little bit. I think we're adjourned for the day.